Welcome. We'll be talking about shock. Again, this is a topic that we are, as cardiothoracic surgical physician assistants, very familiar with and should see almost on a daily basis. Uh, the hope is that uh, this lecture will take a topic that is generally presented in textbooks with graphs of up arrows and down arrows uh, that are meant to be arbitrarily memorized. Uh, it'll take that and really put it into a context of a unified understanding of shock such that you can walk away and without even thinking about it fill in one of those charts yourself because you truly have an integrated um, view of what shock is and all of its manifestations. Shock. Shock is inadequate end organ tissue perfusion such that the delivery of oxygen and nutrients do not meet metabolic demands. It can be boiled down to basic economic principles of supply and demand. And in the case of human physiology, they are equivalent to the delivery of oxygen and the uptake of oxygen. And the two need to be in balance. That supply and demand is represented by your DO2, which is your delivery of oxygen or your supply, and then your VO2 or your uptake of oxygen. And these two need to be in balance with each other in order for the peripheral tissues to get the oxygen that they need. And it's fairly easy to understand that if your DO2 is in deficit, if you have a low delivery of oxygen, then you will have inadequate oxygen delivered to your peripheral tissues. What is less intuitive is that a VO2, if it is too high, will lead to imbalance, but also if it is too low, it will lead to imbalance. And this is easiest to understand if you draw a quick schematic of the body. And we'll start off with our heart and lungs up top, and we'll have an arterial side, and on the bottom we're going to have a cell. And the cell is going to represent our end tissues, our area of perfusion that we care most about getting our oxygen and our substrate to. And then we're going to have a venous side. And so on our arterial side, we can check an ABG, and this will give us our saturation of oxygen. And on the venous side, we can check a VBG, which will give us our saturation of venous oxygen. And our cell down here is going to represent our uptake of oxygen, or our VO2. And this side represents our delivery, starting up over here where oxygen is loaded onto arterial blood in the heart and lungs. So if we have a high VO2, a very high uptake over here, okay, such that even if we have a normal delivery of oxygen, even though our delivery of oxygen is normal, we're so hypermetabolic, we're not meeting our needs, and we're having a relative hypoxic state, which is generated as a result. So even if you have a normal DO2, the high metabolic demand outstrips that, and you can end up with a DO2, VO2 imbalance as a result. The other choice is if your VO2 is very low. So let's say that our uptake is just not happening. In the case of this, perhaps we have a shunt that's going on from one side to another, such that regardless of what our DO2 is, if it's normal or if it's elevated, we're not delivering the oxygen in a way that it can be uptaked. So we have a very low uptake in that particular case. And it's important to discriminate in your mind what your uptake is or your VO2 and the SVO2, which is the actual measured oxygen saturation. So if your uptake of oxygen, your VO2, is going to be very high, right? and this would be in the case of, let's say, hemorrhagic shock or cardiogenic shock, you're going to have a very low SVO2 associated with it because more of what you deliver is being extracted at that point. If you have a very, very low VO2, in the case of, let's say, distributive shock where you're shunting a lot, in that case, most of what you deliver is not going to be utilized or extracted, and your SVO2 is going to be very high as a result. So as you can see, a uh, high uptake or a low uptake, either way, can result in oxygen imbalance. For the most part, 
shock is a low do to state and that is what we will be focusing on the delivery of oxygen and getting perfused good oxygen carrying blood to and peripheral tissues some subsets of shock do have vo2 components right um, and we will talk about those as they come up but for the most part this is a do2 lecture so shock is low DO2. The question becomes, what is DO2? What makes up DO2? So we can define our terms and develop a common language. Well, we know that our preload, our myocardial contractility, and our afterload, when combined together, will yield our stroke volume. And we know that our stroke volume, when combined with our heart rate, will yield our cardiac output. What we need to know now is that our cardiac output, combined with our hemoglobin, the amount of dissolved oxygen in our arterial blood, and the amount of saturated oxygen within our blood, will yield our delivery of oxygen. And so if I'm saying that shock is a low DO2 state, it would make sense then that if any of the components that contribute to the formation of your DO2 was in deficit, then the DO2 would be in deficit. If I put a deficit here, it's going to trickle downstream and work its way to the delivery of oxygen. Furthermore, it would make sense that the type of shock that you go into depends on which component is in deficit. So the type of shock if this is in deficit, it will be different than the type of shock that develops if this is in deficit. And so in that way, all types of shock can be unified based upon this schematic and all result in what we care about most, which is our delivery of oxygen. And we really care about our pure components right, and not our products. We do care about our products, but not in the physiologic construct that we'll be using for this lecture. So our pure components are going to be our preload, myocardial contractility, afterload, heart rate, hemoglobin, and oxygenation, okay? Our components or our um, products are going to be our stroke volume, cardiac output, and our ultimate delivery of oxygen. So when we talk about the body's deficits and its compensation mechanisms, and our goals for treatment, yes, we want our cardiac output to be good, and it's something that we measure and something that we care about, but it's sort of a dirty concept in, in the sense that there are further subcomponents to it. So if I have a deficit in my preload and I look at my stroke volume or my cardiac output as a result, I may or may not have adequate compensation in the different components that create these products. So we're gonna be focusing on the pure components and how they relate. And when you talk about compensation, if I have a deficit, let's say, in preload, okay, my body will try and compensate by increasing the other pure components, myocardial contractility, afterload, heart rate. And so initially, I will see that my cardiac output is the same because I am compensated. But as this grows and the deficit becomes more pronounced, your compensation becomes overcome at that point and you will eventually drop your cardiac output, okay? So if you're looking at just cardiac output and you see that it's normal, you might be missing a deficit that's going early on. And that is the reason why we're looking at our components rather than our products, although we'll be discussing both. So the first type of shock that we'll be talking about is shock associated with a low preload, all right? And this would be hypovolemic shock, right? Low preload. It comes in two forms. There is hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. We're gonna be talking about both of them. Right? The primary deficit in this type of shock, so what is the primary deficit 
In this case, it is a low preload, and often the way we measure it is we measure that indirectly by assessing pressure. We have a low CVP. Okay, obviously it can be measured clinically other ways as well, in measured through imaging modalities. But for the most part, we'll use hemodynamic assessments and say associated with a low CVP, low preload as our primary deficit. Now, in the case of non-hemorrhagic shock, this is our primary deficit. In the case of hemorrhagic shock, not only do we have low preload, but we also have a low hemoglobin. So of the two, hemorrhagic shock would be the more severe. Not only are you losing volume, you're losing oxygen carrying volume. Once we know our deficit, you have to ask yourself, what is the body's compensation mechanism? Okay? And the body's compensation mechanism will be to increase the other modalities that it has available to it. And it in can increase myocardial contractility. And this is not really easy for us to observe purely, okay? If we have an echo, then we can see it. Afterload, we can certainly see that will be manifested by increasing our systemic vascular resistance and increasing our chronotropy or our heart rate certainly is easy to see just by looking at our heart monitor. And those are the main compensation strategies. So you can see as a deficit occurs, and there's a down arrow in the schematic, which trickles downstream through the products to what we care about most, or VO2, we will try and compensate by increasing our other components that we can. Now, for our treatment, the first thing that you always need to do in any type of shock is to do what the body cannot do first. Okay, and there are two things that the body cannot do. It cannot make new water, okay, and you cannot extract more oxygen than what is in the environment around you. Now, you can shift water from intracellular to intravascular spaces a little bit, but it's not going to be enough. For the most part, you either need to ingest water orally or you need to have it given intravenously but you cannot make new preload acutely, okay? In the case of hemoglobin, yes, you can make new red blood cells, but you're gonna take a month to do that, basically. So you can't make new fluid. So while the body is doing what it can in other places, we're going to help it in the most significant way. We'll do what it cannot. And so we'll increase our preload. We're going to give fluid, and we're going to increase the amount of oxygen, or your FiO2, such that I have a greater amount of oxygen in my environment and I can therefore extract more. And this is why the first step in any type of shock treatment is fluid and oxygen, okay? Do what the body cannot do first, right? The next thing to do is to treat the primary deficit. Now, it just so happens that in hypovolemic shock, the primary deficit is what the body cannot do. So we've already done this. We're going to give fluid. Now, in hypovolemic shock, the treatment is fluid, and that is it, right? There's no role for vasopressors or inotropes in hypovolemic, hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic otherwise, shock. And the reason it goes to our physiology. If we are in a stress state, and again, the body cannot distinguish between surgery and being attacked by an animal, if you're losing blood, you're losing blood, you will shunt blood away from your skin, such that hopefully if you are attacked in your cut, you will not bleed. You will also shunt blood away from your kidneys, such that you will not make urine and you will not lose more volume than what you're losing in blood. And you will shunt blood away from your enteric tract because it takes a significant amount of blood and energy to digest. And it's much easier to liberate energy from glycogen stores in your liver acutely and that blood will be put to where it needs to be most, into your heart, to your lungs, to your brain, and your skeletal muscle, your vital structure, so that you can fight or flight and get away. So the problem is this. If you are shunting blood away from those non-vital areas, and you do not give them fluid, if you give them a presser first, if you vasoconstrict them when their body is already trying to vasoconstrict as a compensation mechanism, you will further shunt and this is when you will have ischemia develop in those beds. And this is why patients develop uh, black toes and fingers and have necrosis in those areas. 
And this is why patients go into ATN and renal failure, because they're already shunting blood and now you're further shunting blood. This is why patients have ischemic bowel as a result. Pressors being given when fluid should be given. And you'll hear the saying, fill the tank first, fill the tank first. And what they're saying, and really fill the tank refers to distributive shock, which we'll get to, is that before you give a pressor, you need to make sure that your preload is adequate, okay? In the case of hypovolemic shock, there is no role for pressors, all right? You, you are still symptomatic and hypotensive, then you either need to give more fluid or you need to give more fluid faster. And if you still are hypovolemic after doing so, then you have a surgical bleed going on that needs surgical correction. Of the two, hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic is arguably the more serious form. Not only do you have a deficit in volume or preload, you also have a deficit in hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying component of your blood. So two of the factors that contribute to the delivery of oxygen are in deficit when you're in hemorrhagic shock as opposed to just one when you're in non-hemorrhagic shock, that one being hypovolemia or low preload. Hemorrhagic shock can be broken down into classes based on severity, classes one through four. And for class one, this is basically what you would experience if you were to donate blood. It is asymptomatic. It is equivalent to less than 15% blood loss by percentage volume. This is equals about less than 750 cc's worth of blood loss. Class two is the first class to show symptoms, and that symptom is tachycardia. It is your body's first easily observable attempt at compensation. In class two, there is a 15 to 30% blood volume loss by percentage volume, and this equals about 750 to 1500 cc's. In class three, at this point, your body's compensation mechanisms have now been overwhelmed and you are in shock. It is equal to a 30 or 40 percent blood loss by volume and that equals about 1,500 to 2 liters worth of blood loss. In class 4, it is associated with evidence of end organ malperfusion and the first and easiest to identify is urine output. Uh, you can also have end organ malperfusion as evidence in lab values. If your LFTs go up, it would be evidence of shock liver, or if your pancreatic enzymes were to go up, it would be evidence of shock pancreatitis. A lactate, which is elevating, signifies a transition from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism and can be evidence of tissue malperfusion in really any bed or multiple tissue beds. If you have poor perfusion to your brain, altered mental status, or mental status changes will also become evident. But urine output is easy to observe, and the kidneys can often be thought of as windows to your cardiovascular system and its function. So low urine output is often what's observed first. Class four, by volume, you have about greater than 40% blood loss, and this is equivalent to about greater than two liters worth of blood loss. So based upon your symptomatology, whether or not you're tachycardic, whether or not you're hypotensive or oliguric, you can have some sense of the severity or the degree of blood loss. Information can also be gathered or extrapolated about the patient's clinical status based upon how they respond to your treatment. And patients can fall into one of three treatment response categories. They can be rapid responders, transient responders, or non-responders. Rapid responders tend to have a finite amount of blood loss. So they cannot be in class one, they would be asymptomatic. So at least class two and at minimum have tachycardia. The rapid responders have symptoms and then when you give them treatment, in this case fluids, their symptoms abate. And when the treatment is finished, when the bolus is finished, they continue to be hemodynamically stable. They can be treated with fluid replacement and if in the case of hemorrhagic shock, they should be transfused with blood. If you lose blood, you should replace with blood. Transient responders tend to be either class two or class three. They tend to have either a large finite amount of blood loss, such that an initial bolus will not be sufficient and they may require multiple, or they may just have a slow ongoing blood loss. Transient responders will have symptoms, tachycardia, hypotension, and when the treatment is instituted, when their fluid is going in, their symptoms will abate, their tachycardia will resolve, and their hypotension will resolve. However, when their fluid bolus is completed, their symptoms will return, their tachycardia and their hypotension will return. And again, 
This may be due to the fact that their finite amount of blood loss has just not been completely replaced, and the second bolus will take them from the category of transient responder to rapid responder. Or they may have a slow ongoing blood loss such that you can keep up with it as you are treating them, but as soon as you are finished treating them, they quickly return to their state of metabolic derangement. These tend to be amenable to fluid, but they may need some sort of intervention, some type of embolization possibly. Non-responders tend to be class four, and if they're not class four, they will be class four soon. They tend to have a very fast, very ongoing blood loss, and they do not respond to treatment. They are tachycardic, they are hypotensive, they are oliguric and have evidence of end organ malperfusion, and you give them fluid and they stay deranged. They do not improve. And so these patients cannot really be treated successfully by fluid alone. They often have a surgical cause of bleeding that requires immediate intervention. So by looking at their class and by looking at the response type, you can figure out where the patients are in their blood loss and how to treat them. The second type of hypovolemic shock is non-hemorrhagic shock. It is when you are losing fluid but not losing hemoglobin. And this can be broken into various subtypes. You can have pure water loss or what is called dehydration. You can have water and electrolyte loss, which would be volume loss or fluid loss. And this is probably the most common. This would be your vomiting, this would be your diarrhea or your intestinal fistulas. And then you can have water, electrolyte, and protein loss. And these would be your burns or your sequestering ascites from liver failure. And whatever you lose, that's what you should replace with. If you've lost water, they need water. If they've lost water and electrolytes, you should give them crystalloid. If they've lost water, electrolytes, and protein, then colloid. So we have now established that the first line treatment for all types of shock is to give fluid, do what the body cannot do. And in hypovolemic shock, that's also our primary deficit that we will be addressing. And so as such, we need to talk about fluid and fluid within the body and fluid that we administer to patients and some of the physiology behind it and some of the rules that govern them. And the place to start is with our osmolality. And the most concise definition for osmolality is number of solutes per solution. Very short, very simple. So if I have a container and I have nothing in it, my osmolality is zero. I have uh, fluid, I have solution, but I have no solutes in it. If I have three particles in it, I have three milliosmoles now. Number of solutes per solution. If I were add, to add three more, I would have increased my osmolality to six, okay? Now, the formula that governs osmolality within our serum, within our body, it is our sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus BUN divided by 2.6. And in the case of the 18 and the 2.6, these are numbers to correct for the molecular weight of these structures such that the units will be converted to milliosmoles. And with sodium, which is a monovalent cation, it is expressed in milliequivalents. Milliequivalents are equal to milliosmoles, as long as the and the ion is monovalent. So the idea is to get everything into milliosmoles to express our serum osmolality. So that's osmolality. Now the question becomes, what is tonicity? And tonicity is relative osmolality. It is the comparison of one osmolality to another, okay? So let's take uh, a few experiments that we can do. We can look at an intravascular space and an intracellular space, and between them, we will put a semi-permeable membrane, and water freely passes between semi-permeable membranes such that you will have an equal amount in either component. Let's say I add a structure to this that passes through semi-permeable membranes with the same ease as water. And let's say if this is BUN, we'll add 10 of BUN. What's gonna happen here? Well, it's gonna pass and equilibrate and reach a homeostasis the same way water does, such that I'll have five of BUN here and five of BUN here. 
So in that case, I have increased the osmolality of each component, but the tonicity has stayed the same. They are isotonic to each other. It can either be hypertonic, one is greater than the other, isotonic, they're the same, or hypotonic, one is less than the other, depending on what your point of reference is. Now let's take the same solution or the same situation in the intravascular space, the semi-permeable membrane, and the intracellular space. And this time, let's add 10 of something that at least initially doesn't cross a semi-permeable membrane, at least not passively, right? Let's add 10 of sodium. And what is going to happen here? Well, initially, you're gonna have 10 of sodium that stays in this intravascular compartment. Thus, you have increased the osmolality of that compartment, but you have increased the tonicity relative to the intracellular space. And your body will try to compensate for this by shifting what it can shift, which is water, across in an attempt to dilute this, such that the concentration in here is increased and the concentration in here is decreased and they're brought closer to each other over time. But initially, what's going to happen is that you're going to create a hypertonic situation. Now, the question is, what is the formula for tonicity that governs tonicity in your body and in your serum? So, well, let's look. Our tonicity is equal to two times the sodium plus the glucose divided by 18. And that's it. Now, what's missing from this? What's missing is your BUN. And the question is, why is your BUN missing? Well, we already know why. BUN freely passes through semi-permeable membranes just as easily as water does. So it has no tonic effect, it doesn't exert a tonic effect, and therefore it is not within the formula for tonicity, only for osmolality. That's why if you develop azotemia, it's a uh, hyperosmotic state, but it's not a hypertonic state. So two times the sodium plus the glucose divided by 18. So let's do a little math and figure out what this works down to. So normal serum sodium is 134, um, or 135 to 145, we use 140 as a normal. So two times 140 is 280, right? For glucose, we'll just say 100 is a normal glucose, and we'll make, to make math easy, we'll round this up to 20. So basically five, right? So 280 plus five, our normal tonicity should be 285, and there's a range, it should be about 285 to 300. But if you look, right, what is the major contributor to this end number? Is it glucose, which contributes about five? No. Is it sodium, which contributes about 280? Yes, okay? And so even if you are severely hyperglycemic, let's say you have um, hyperosmolar, uh, non-ketotic hyperglycemia, okay? And your sodium is almost 1,000, all right? In that case, you're still, your glucose will begin to participate in tonicity, but it still won't compare to what your sodium is doing at that particular point. Most of the time, for most patients who have their sugars, let's say, below 200, um, it's not going to be the major determiner of where sodium or where water goes in your body. The main determiner is going to be sodium. And so you may remember from physiology class the saying that water follows sodium. And essentially what we have done is using physiologic formulas and mathematics proven this theory that water indeed follows sodium and that sodium is the main determiner of where water goes at least acutely within the body. As such, it becomes important to understand what are the concentrations of sodium within various bodily compartments and within the type of fluids that we will be given. You can think of your body as having three main fluid compartments, your intravascular space, your intracellular space, and your interstitial or your third space. Obviously, there are cavities. So you have your thoracic cavity and your peritoneal cavity, which can collect fluid as well. But for the most part, your normal serum sodium level has a sodium concentration of 135 to 145 milli equivalents per liter. The interstitial space has about 144 milli equivalents per liter. And the intracellular space is about 10 milli equivalents per liter of sodium. So sodium is mainly an extracellular cation.
we have two categories of fluid that we can give our patients, crystalloid and colloid. In the case of crystalloids, the most common fluids that we give would be normal saline, lactated ringers, half normal saline, and D5W. On the chart, you see a complete list and the sodium equivalents within each of them. Normal sodium has about 154 milliequivalents of sodium. Lactated ringers has 130 milliequivalents of sodium. So in comparison to the serum sodium level within the body, normal saline is slightly hypertonic and lactated ringers is slightly hypotonic. For the most part, these two fluids though are so close to the serum tonicity of sodium within the body that they are considered isotonic fluids. Half normal saline has obviously half of what normal does and has about 77 milliequivalents and free water has zero milliequivalents of sodium. Now you cannot give free water alone into the intravascular space. It is so significantly hypotonic it would cause hemolysis. And for this reason, it is given with dextrose and the dextrose gives it enough osmolality to overcome this problem. But as we have seen, the dextrose does not contribute significantly to ultimately where fluid will go. The dextrose is rapidly uptaken into the cells and does not participate. And for that reason, if you notice, none of the other fluids are listed with dextrose. It is best in your mind to separate dextrose from sodium and whether or not you give them together in fluids. So you'll often hear people say, give D5W, okay. But then they'll say, give D half normal saline or D normal saline, D5 normal saline. And really the dextrose is not necessary at all to where fluid is going to go and it's not gonna help you. It's just gonna make your patient hyperglycemic. So the decision to give dextrose or not should be based upon whether or not the patient needs dextrose for substrate reasons or for blood sugar reasons. The main determiner of where fluid goes will be your sodium. The only one that needs dextrose is free water. If we look at other types of fluids that are commonly given in the CBICU, sodium bicarbonate is frequently given for acid-base disturbance reasons, but as you can see, it is significantly hypertonic and it has a sodium of 890 milliequivalents per liter. So one of the side effects of significant amounts of bicarbonate being given for acid-base imbalance is hypernatremia, and that is something that you do need to be aware of and careful of and to monitor. The second choice, instead of crystalloid, we also have colloid. And most of the ones listed here are not used very frequently. The most common use in CBICUs are your albumins, your 5% and 25% albumin. If you look at the sodium concentration, 130 to 160 milliequivalents per liter, so it is very close to either LR or normal saline. So the crystalloid base of the colloid fluid is really isotonic. The difference is, is that it has a colloid, in this case, a certain amount of albumin. In the case of 5% albumin, it has 50 grams per liter, and in the case of 25% albumin, it has 250 grams per liter worth of albumin. So we've talked a lot about crystalloid and sodium and water relationships specifically, and how they determine where fluid goes within your body. And there is another set of rules that are going on that also govern where fluid goes, and that has to do with oncotic pressures. And your oncotic pressure is due to large molecules which cannot pass through uh, semipermeable membranes, which creates an inward drawing force of fluid uh, into your intravascular space where they reside. And so your oncotic force is in balance or closely in balance, not quite in balance, with your hydrostatic force. And so the idea is that if your heart is here and your arterial system is pumping out, your venous system is pumping in, your hydrostatic force is the pressure generated by the forward movement of blood such that it is constantly pushing fluid through the permeable areas of your vascular out into the interstitial space. The oncotic force is constantly trying to draw it in through oncotic pressure. And as I've stated, these two are close to being in balance, but they are not in balance. One of them wins out, and the one that wins out is actually the hydrostatic force. While um, a significant portion is brought back in, this wins by about 5%. And the issue is, why are you constantly not developing edema? And the answer is your lymphatics. What your oncotic force 
cannot correct for your lymphatic spring back to your venous system. And so in that sense, you have a mechanism that keeps this slight imbalance in check. And you can see when this imbalance is disrupted for various reasons, and patients develop lymphatic limbs, distal to surgical sites where lymphatics have been disrupted. So sodium, again, is the major acute determiner of where fluid goes in your body. This is a bit more chronic. Um, and certainly, if your lymphatics are interrupted acutely surgically, that can be an issue. Um, but it is important to keep your oncotic pressure as good as you can. The best way to do this is through nutrition. Now, we do give fluids that have oncotic molecules in them, or molecules that generate oncotic pressures, and we often give albumin. And the effects of albumin are significant However, they are short-lived. If you have an intact renal system and make adequate urine, then any albumin that you give, for the most part, has been processed and excreted within about a half hour time. So albumin is great for rapid fluid shifts and for short-term needs for acute hydration. Not only would you have the benefit of the normal saline uh, that it, the uh, albumin is within, you would also have the benefit of the albumin itself, the oncotic pressure it generates. And so it's used frequently in CVICUs where post-operative fluid shifts are moment to moment and very fast. Um, but for long term and for other fields of medicine, uh, giving colloids isn't as beneficial. And uh, certainly if you have a low albumin, which is chronic and due to malnutrition, you're not going to replace that low albumin by giving them albumin. Um, the way to replace that is through nutrition. So we've learned a lot about sodium now, and it's time to take what we've learned and put it into a real world example. Let's go back to the schematic where we have an intravascular space, a semi-permeable membrane, and an intracellular space. And this time, let's look at real physiologic parameters. We know we have about 144 milliequivalents of sodium in our interstitial space. We know we have about 10 in our intracellular space, and we know we have a range about 135 to 145 in our intravascular space. And we know we have different types of fluids that we can give and that we commonly give. We know we have normal saline, we know we have LR, we know we use half normal a lot, and then sometimes we use D5W, right? And we know the sodium concentrations of these now. We know we have 150 milliequivalents in normal saline, around the 155. We know for LR we have 130, half normal we have about 77, and D5W we have zero. And the question becomes, what is gonna happen to the osmolality and more importantly the tonicity when we add these types of fluids to our intravascular space? So if we add a liter of normal saline right, into our intravascular space, not only is all of our liter, at least initially, going to stay there, but we're going to get a draw because we are slightly hypertonic, okay? And this is why normal saline is a great bolusing fluid. You get what you give, and then you get a little plus from the surrounding tissue. If we give LR, in that case, we're slightly hypotonic, about 130, and in that case, we might get a tiny little leak this way, but for the most part, what we give is gonna stay here, right? And these are both close enough to what our normal serum value is, such that these are considered isotonic, right? Close enough to what our serum is, such that when we give it, what we give is what we get, okay? And this is why these are used as bolusing fluids. If we were to give half normal saline, okay, now we're giving 77 milliequivalents, in essence, if you were to give a liter of this, it would be the exact same as giving 500 of this, uh, which is normal saline, and 500 a D5W, right? So immediately this is going to equilibrate, and you lose a lot of what you bolus with. So this is not an efficient bolus fluid or a way to resuscitate someone. This would be more of a maintenance type fluid. And again, depending on what your loss is, that's what you should replace with, but for most patients who in our CVICUs tend to have significant fluid shifting going on and have had significant blood loss when we are replacing them with crystalloid, we want to use isotonic fluids. 
and neither of them are perfect. They both have their um, consequences to using them and to using significant amounts of them, but at least this is the concept that governs why we use it and how to use it and how it generates effects that we want. As we've been working on two, one of our main choices for bolusing with fluids is normal saline, the other is lactated ringers, and we will discuss both of these and the benefits and some of the risks associated with both of them. So normal saline is sodium chloride, it breaks down into sodium and chloride in a one-to-one -one relationship, a cation and an anion. And if we look at the relative concentration of these ions in our serum, and the relative concentration of these within the fluid that we're giving normal saline, you will notice something very interesting. Our normal serum sodium is about 135 to 145, and the concentration of sodium in normal saline is 155 milliequivalent, so it is slightly hypertonic. And if you continuously give someone a normal saline infusion, over time they will become hypernatremic. It will be a slow process though. If you look at the serum chloride concentration, it's about 98 to 108 to milliequivalents per liter. However, because sodium chloride is a one-to-one -one relationship in normal saline, if there is 155 milliequivalents of sodium, there's also 155 milliequivalents of chloride. So whereas normal saline will cause a slight hypernatremia, it is very severely hyperchloremic. And as a result, the administration of normal saline will lead to a dilutional acidosis and an inorganic hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. The bicarbonate within the serum will be diluted and excreted as there will be an excess of extracellular anions in the form of chloride. So greater than about two liters worth of bolus over about a two hour period, so a large amount of normal saline infused over a short period of time, will create a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Lactated ringers is thought to be more physiologic. Lactated ringers has sodium, chloride, potassium, and lactate, which a competent liver will break into bicarbonate. So again, our normal serum sodium is 135 to 145. In LR, our sodium concentration is 130. For potassium, our normal serum concentration is 3.5 to 5, and in LR it's about 4. And for this reason, you need to be careful using LR in patients with renal dysfunction. Even though it is a small amount of potassium, that potassium can build up over time and lead to hyperkalemia and conduction and dysrhythmia problems. The chloride concentration in the serum, again, is 98 to 108, and in LR it is 109. So it's still hyperchloremic although in this case, very, very mildly, especially in comparison to normal saline. And for bicarbonate, your normal serum is 22 to 26, and with LR, you get about 35 milliequivalents per liter. So some of the effects of hyperchloremia and acidosis can be abated by using LR, and there are various strategies to balance the benefits and side effects of each fluid type. So we've taken a significant amount of time and talked about hypovolemic shock, okay, a low preload state, and we're now going to transition to distributive shock. And there's a difference between the two, and the difference is this, absolute versus relative hypovolemia. So in the case of absolute hypovolemia, if I have a 10 gallon tank and I have 10 gallons of fluid in it, absolute hypovolemia would keep that same 10 gallon tank, but you would decrease to about 5 gallons. I have lost 5 gallons. I am now 50% of where I used to be. I have had an absolute volume loss. And this is hypovolemic shock. Distributive shock, which is what we're going to be talking about next, is when you have relative hypovolemia. So in this case, I have a 10 gallon tank with 10 gallons of fluid in it. And what happens is that my tank grows to a 20 gallon tank. I still have 10 gallons of fluid in it though. And the end result is that I have a 50% volume loss. And it's not because I've lost fluid, it's because my tank has grown. And so this is the difference between absolute and relative hypovolemia. One is volume loss, one is tank growth.
So we've been talking about volume loss, and now we're going to talk about tank growth. And in reality, these are very nice textbook concepts. Uh, in clinical practice, there's a lot of overlap. And in fact, most patients who are in distributive shock have elements of both relative and absolute hypovolemia. And in the case of septic shock, when the patient is vasodilated and has leaky capillaries, yes, they're vasodilated, so their tank is, busy, uh, is bigger, but they have leaky capillaries, so their volume gets placed into the interstitial space. And so they have an element of absolute hypovolemia. But it's important to understand these two concepts because it's going to affect how we treat our patients. The next class of shock that we'll be talking about will be distributive shock. And distributive shock is associated with low afterload, right? And the way that we measure afterload by hemodynamics is our systemic vascular resistance. So we have a low SVR, right? And there are different subtypes or subclasses of shock. You have infectious or, or what would be septic shock. You can have neurogenic shock. You can have immunomodulated forms of shock, such as anaphylaxis or anaphylactoid, and you can have an endocrinopathy resulting in shock. The main one uh, would be an Addisonian crisis or acute adrenal insufficiency. And again, going through the same schematic we did with uh, hypovolemic shock, with distributive shock, so the primary deficit is a low systemic vascular resistance. You are vasodilated, you have low afterload, okay? What is the ways that the body will then compensate? Well, it will increase myocardial contractility. Again, not as easy for us to measure. And it will increase heart rate. So we have increased contractility and increased heart rate, okay? We cannot make new fluid and we cannot extract more oxygen than what we have. So what are the treatments? Well, the first thing to do is do what the body cannot do. We're going to give fluid. Therefore, hopefully we will increase our preload, right? And we are going to give oxygen and increase the dissolved and saturated oxygen within our blood. Now, the body is trying to compensate as we discussed, okay? Once we have filled our tank, as we spoke of, then the issue is we need to treat our primary deficit. And our primary deficit is a low afterload. So we are going to use vasopressors in an attempt to increase our systemic vascular resistance. Make sense? And this is the basis for almost all types of distributive shock. And we'll go through the various subsets and some of the specific algorithms that we do. Right? And the idea is that as your afterload decreases, your body tries to compensate by placing up arrows by your heart rate and your myocardial contractility. But once this vasodilation gets low enough, and remember that there is an, el an element of not only relative hypovolemia, but because of leaky capillaries and sepsis, you have absolute hypovolemia in some types. Um, you will see once your compensation mechanism is overcome, a trickle downstream such that your stroke volume will be low, cardiac output will be low, and delivery of oxygen will ultimately be low. And our job is to try and correct this by giving them fluid and giving them pressures such that we can normalize these downstream products. So first talking about septic shock, and we've talked a little bit about this, the fact that they both have relative and absolute hypovolemias and dilation of leaky capillaries and also shunting going on such that the SVO2 in this type of shock tends to be high uh, rather than low as it is in all other types of shock. The way to specifically treat is to physiologically optimize patients. So the first step is to give fluid and you do so, you give fluid such that you want your CBP to be optimized. You want it to be about 8 to 12. And so an up arrow is placed here. You do what the patient can't do, right? At the same time, put them on oxygen, and we'll put up arrows next to our dissolved and saturated oxygen. If they are still symptomatic, the next thing you want to attack 
is the mean arterial pressure. Uh, so we've addressed our CVP. We want our mean arterial pressure to be at least 65, maybe even more than 70. And the way to do this is through vasopressors. And again, you might need one, you might need multiple. If the patient is not responsive to vasopressors, it may be that they have acute adrenal insufficiency, superimposed, or as the primary type of distributive shock. So they may or may not need steroids, possibly. But you want their mean arterial pressure to be adequate. So we're putting an up arrow over here. Now, if we measure our SVO2 and it is still not adequate, all right, and the SVO2 is really a representation of what we have delivered, sort of the best way to measure it, then we go on to further optimizing our patient. And step three would be to give inotropes or chronotropes. And the idea is that you're going to place an up arrow by your heart rate, an up arrow by your myocardial contractility, such that they are optimized. You want to make sure that your cardiac output and in index are adequate, and the resulting SVO2 is hopefully between that 60 to 70 range. If you are still in deficit, the last thing that you can consider doing is to transfuse them, is to put an up arrow by their hemoglobin, and therefore, in theory, giving them a greater oxygen carrying capacity. Now, there is problems with giving blood. It can be immunosuppressive. You can have transfusion reactions. And too high a hemoglobin hematocrit can create a high level of viscosity such that you actually have a poorer perfusion. It is in debate, but the concept, at least in this schematic, which has been proposed, is related to this schematic over here and the delivery of oxygen. What they have actually done in doing so in a systematic and logical and organized way is optimized all the physiologic parameters that will first affect your stroke volume and then your cardiac output and finally your delivery of oxygen such that in each way that is available to us we're trying to overcome this deficit of a low afterload low SVR. Now we've talked a lot about vasoreactive medications and giving vasopressors as a way of increasing our systemic vascular resistance, and we should go into some detail about them. Now, in reality, what we care about most are the receptors within our heart and within our peripheral vasculature. And within our heart, we have beta-1 receptors, and beta-1 receptors make your heart beat, okay? They increase inotropy, or your myocardial contraction components of uh, delivery of oxygen and increase chronotropy or increase the heart rate component that contributes to the delivery of oxygen. And it depends on whether or not the beta-1 receptors are located within the muscular tissue or the conductive, conductive tissue of the body respectively, what effect that they will have. And in the peripheral vasculature, you have beta-2 receptors and alpha-1 receptors. And the beta-2 make your vasculature bigger, beta bigger. And these receptors are located in different tissues in different concentrations, such that your skeletal muscle has a greater population of beta-2 receptors. So their response to catecholamines will be to vasodilate, such that if you are in a fight or flight situation, you'll have more blood in response to catecholamines going to your skeletal muscles so you can fight or run away. The other tissues may have higher, higher concentrations of alpha receptors. And alpha receptors, you can think of it as a lasso around your vasculature, constricting it, making it smaller. That's a response to alpha stimulation, such that you will shunt blood away from tissue beds that are not necessary. So you will shunt blood away from your skin, from your kidneys, from your gut, because these are non-vital areas to perfuse when you are in a stress state. And this is the short of what you need to know about where receptors are located and what their general effects are. Now, there are receptors located in many other tissue beds uh, in different populations, and it is important to understand that they are there and what effects they have when they are stimulated. And this is what will allow you to understand the side effect profile of the medications that you give when you give them. These are the desired effects. However, there are more effects to these medications than just the desired effects. 
It's important to also keep in mind that you have receptors in all tissue beds, not just in the ones that we are interested in affecting by giving our medications. So while our primary concern are our beta-1 receptors within our heart and our beta-2 and our alpha receptors within our blood vessels, it is also important to know that there are alpha and beta receptors within your gastrointestinal system, for example, such that stimulation from catecholamines will cause constriction and retention of fluid through its effect on the sphincters within the GI tract, and catecholamines and inotropes will also cause decreased motility and are associated with ileus. So with this in mind, patients on high doses of catecholamines and vasopressors may develop ileus and gastroparesis as side effects, and these should be monitored for and expected and treated appropriately. And for the sake of completion, a fairly comprehensive list of different bodily tissue beds and their associated receptors and side effects has been given. Knowing what we know now, let's talk about what the main catecholamines available to us are and what they can do. The first one that we'll talk about is dopamine, and dopamine is the only of these, and we have dopamine, epinephrine, neosinephrine, isoproteranol, levofed, dobutamine, and vasopressin. Dopamine is the only one to stimulate D1 receptors, dopamine receptors, and it does so at very low doses. It'll cause vasodilation within the kidneys and cause you to urinate. And you'll certainly hear people say, well, renal dose dopamine doesn't work. And that's sort of a dogmatic statement that really doesn't convey the meaning of what they're trying to say. Uh, giving renal dose dopamine does not decrease the incidence of renal failure, the need for hemodialysis, the length of stay in the ICU, or the overall mortality of patients. It does not do those things. However, it works. It will dilate your vasculature and it will stimulate dopamine receptors and it will make you pee. So be careful when people say that statement, renal dose dopamine doesn't work. It does work. It just doesn't achieve certain goals that they might want. That being said, it is still frequently used throughout many ICUs and used sometimes to promote urinary output uh, improvement. As the dose increases, when you get to mid-dose dopamine, what you will find is that you will have beta receptor stimulation. You will have increase inotropy and chronotropy, and maybe the tiniest bit about of uh, amount of vasodilation, but this is balanced by the fact that at its highest doses, you will have a vasopressor effect. And usually the problem with dopamine is that to get to this vasopressor effect, you have to go through this inotropic chronotropic effect, and you are often limited by heart rate and tachycardia and the precipitation of dysrhythmias as a result before you reach this. And as such, it's not the best of vasopressors to use. It can be used a little bit for uh, inotropy and chronotropy and certainly for urine output, although again, not to specific ends. And obviously it does not stimulate vasopressin receptors. Epinephrine is sort of like a shotgun. It basically covers everything. It's going to do your, it's not going to do any dopamine or any vasopressors, but for your catecholamine receptors, it will do beta receptors strongest, and it will do strongest at low, lower doses. That's what it will do first. As you increase the dose, yes, you will see that there is a vasopressor effect and that the blood pressure will go up. But primarily, uh, epinephrine is more of an inotrope uh, than a vasopressor. But it basically stimulates everything as far as your catecholamine receptors are uh, responsible. So you have one that is dose dependent. You have one that does everything. The next is neosinephrine. And neosinephrine, again, let's not do these, it is pretty much a pure alpha receptor, right? So we have a pure alpha. So it will increase your systemic vascular resistance. It will help you clamp down and hopefully uh, raise your blood pressure. The issue can be that if your heart is not strong enough, if you do not have a good ejection fraction, you are also increasing the work that the heart needs to do. 
And if it has no beta stimulation, it might not be strong enough to overcome these effects. So in low ejection fractions, alpha stimulation alone can be problematic and it's something you need to be aware of and to be monitoring for. Isoproteranol is basically going to be a pure beta. So again, it's not gonna do dopamine and vasopressin, but it will do beta. It'll give you good inotropy and good chronotropy, but it will do so at the price of blood pressure. You're going to have unopposed vasodilation and uh, no, essentially no alpha stimulation. At higher doses, again, any of these will do everything. But for the most part, at usual clinical use doses, you'll see inotropy, chronotropy, but with vasodilation. So you might be limited a little bit by blood pressure when you use this. Levofed is a mixed alpha, right? And the idea is that you are going to be mainly alpha, okay? But you will have some beta, right? So whereas neosinephrine had the trouble of being unopposed and whether or not you have the contractility to overcome this increased work, here you should get the same contraction, but you'll have a little help in overcoming it as well. Dobutamine is a mixed beta, and here the idea is that you have a very strong beta, much like you did uh, with isoproteranol, but hopefully you should have less um, hypotension because you should have at least some alpha effect, right? And the last is vasopressin, and vaso is, is on its own uh, category by itself and will stimulate vasopressin receptors. So you will look at different charts and maybe they might have one more plus than what has been placed here or one less or it's slightly different. What really matters most is the concept. And the concept is, is that dopamine is dose dependent. It can give you a renal dose, a chronotropic dose, and a vasopressor dose. Epinephrine basically does everything but is a strong beta at lower doses. Neo is mainly, is a, is a pure alpha, ISO is a pure beta, Levo is a mixed alpha, and dobutamine is a mixed beta, and Vaso is on its own, as milrinone would be on its own. So the idea is you have one of each category of drug, and these are the sort of general effects that they're going to have. You have your pure drugs, your mixed drugs, your everything, and your rainbow. Neurogenic shock, again, is another type of distributive shock. It is associated with injuries to the spinal cord above the T5 level. This results in a loss of sympathetic outflow, and this loss of sympathetic outflow will result in a decreased systemic vascular resistance through vasodilation and a decreased heart rate, bradycardia. The peripheral vasodilation will come from loss of alpha-1 stimulation, and the decreased heart rate and decreased force of contraction will come from the loss of stimulation of beta-1 receptors within the muscular tissue of the heart, resulting in negative inotropy, and within the conductive tissues of the heart, resulting in negative chronotropy. So of the types of distributive shock, neurogenic shock is a more severe one because you have multiple factors that contribute to the DO2 delivery of oxygen that are in deficit. And you have one of your compensation mechanisms, specifically your heart rate, which has been removed as an option. For neurogenic shock, again, this is a subset or subtype of distributive shock. Your primary deficit is going to be a low afterload, less SVR, systemic vascular resistance. It has a extra component, which makes it more severe, of bradycardia. So you have lost one of your compensation mechanisms. So really the only compensation you have might be to increase your myocardial contractility because you can't make new water, you can't extract more oxygen, and making hemoglobin is too slow. So it's a form of shock without really much in the way of compensation. And if you're a pediatric patient who relies mainly on chronotropy to increase your cardiac output, then you really don't even have this myocardial contractility as an option. So spinal shock is dangerous for that reason because of its lack of compensation, and especially in pediatric patients, it can be even more significantly devastating. This is probably the only type of shock where you may see uh, vasopressors given before a patient is resuscitated. 
and i would say that it would have to be the situation where the patient did not have associated blood loss with their spinal trauma because if they do have an element of hemorrhagic shock superimposed on their neurogenic shock then absolutely they need their volume replaced before their vasopressors are started spinal shock as a caveat is not the same as neurogenic shock it is a neurologic exam phenomenon term it is the phenomenon that is present after a spinal injury and is associated with the absence of all volitional and reflex activity below the level of that lesion. This is in the presence of an absence of imaging evidence of injury and the return of function may or may not be possible depending on the severity, course, and completeness of the injury. Immunologic sources of distributive shock also warrant discussion and the two types are anaphylactic and anaphylactoid. The root ana means against, phylact means to protect, and tic means to occur. So in translation, the body's protection system or its immunologic system is working against an occurrence or an exposure to an antigen. Oid means like, so it is a response of the body's protection system which is like an anaphylactic response. And the pathways are different for the two types. However, their end physiologic result is the same. The end common pathway is a mast cell and basophil release of histamine, vasodilation with increased vascular permeability, so you have both growth of your tank and loss of fluid from the intravascular to the interstitial space, bronchoconstriction, pruritus, and platelet aggregation. And the anaphylactic response is due to the adaptive immune system, which is the more teleologically advanced form of your immune system. The adaptive is like a targeted bullet. It recognizes specific antigens. It uses antibodies, specifically IgE antibodies. It requires a previous antigen exposure which means that the first exposure will not result in an anaphylactic response, however, the second will. Once the response has been established, it is not dose dependent, which means the concept of test dosing does not make sense. The response to one gram will be the same as response to one milligram. And prophylaxis is less successful. With anaphylactoid, this response is associated with the innate immune system. It is the more primitive form of your immune system. The innate immune system recognizes self from non-self. It uses the complement mediated pathway of immunity to achieve its goals. It does not require previous exposure. So you can have what appears to be anaphylaxis, although it's really anaphylactoid, if it is your first exposure. It is dose dependent, so you will have a larger response to a larger dose and it is also more amendable to prophylaxis. So an example of an anaphylactoid reaction would be a reaction to contrast dye. The drug of choice for anaphylactic shock is epinephrine, and usually the dose is 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams given IM, and it is given in the thigh when the patient is in the supine position, and it can be given every 10 to 15 minutes to result, and the solution that is used should be a one per 1,000 solution. This is different than what is used in cardiac arrest. The dose is 0.5 to one milligram. It is given IV in that case, five minutes, and the solution is one per 10,000. So it is important to remember the difference between the dose of epinephrine and the route of administration and the technique for administration for anaphylactic and anaphylactoid shock versus cardiac arrest. Endocrinopathies are also sources of distributive shock, and the one that we will be addressing, and the one that is most common, is acute adrenal insufficiency, or an episodium crisis. And to understand this, it is best to go back and take a quick look at some embryology and some physiology of the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland actually is made up of two separate tissues with different embryologic origins. The adrenal cortex arises from the mesoderm, specifically the lateral mesoderm. The ectoderm gives rise to the surface ectoderm and the neuroectoderm, 
and the neuroectoderm gives rise to the neural crest and the neural tube, and it is the neural crest line of cells that give rise to the adrenal medulla. What is interesting is that these two tissues from separate embryologic origins and locations find their way together such that one envelops the other. At six weeks of gestation, the adrenal gland is nothing more than the mesodermal primordium of the fetal cortex. By seven weeks, we see that the neural crest cells have migrated to an adjacent position next to this fetal cortex. By eight weeks, you start to see encapsulation of the medulla by the cortex, and you start to see a transition from the fetal cortex to the early permanent cortex. Late within the fetal period, you continue to see further encapsulation, and by the time you are a newborn, you still have a component of your fetal cortex, and you have established two zones of your permanent cortex, your zona glomerulosa and your zona fasciculata, and you have complete invagination of the medulla. By the time you're a one-year-old, you have near complete resolution of the fetal cortex, and by the time you are four years old, you have now established what normal adult adrenal gland will look like with your three cortical zones, your zona glomerulosa, your fasciculata, and your reticularis, with a medulla in the center. Each of these three layers, you can see they are from the same primordial fetal cortex. They start from the same tissue and they differentiate into different cell types. And as they do, they build upon a common molecular biology and their differentiation represents branch points within the cellular machinery that they develop such that they can put forth different endpoint molecules. As you can see, all of the pathways within the three zones start with a base substrate of cholesterol. And in fact, the second step is also the same. They all have a second step of pregnenolone. The third step for the fasciculata and reticularis is also a common. However, beyond that, they branch. The zona glomerulosa produces mineralocorticoids, the most important and abundant of which is aldosterone. The effect of aldosterone is sodium and therefore water, chloride, and bicarbonate reabsorption and retention. It also promotes potassium and hydrogen ion secretion, and this is carried out through the juxtaglomerular cells within the kidney. The zona fasciculata has an end product of glucocorticoids, the main of which is cortisol. However, there's also corticosterone and cortisone. And the effects of these, among others, is glucose homeostasis. However, we will talk more about them in detail in an upcoming slide. And the zona reticularis secretes androgens. And the common substrate of cholesterol that is used for the generation of these steroid molecules can be either from stores within the blood or stores within the tissue of the adrenal gland itself. So we'll look at the specific and detailed physiology of the products of each of the zones. So starting with the zona glomerulosa, this is responsible for the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. And there are two stimuli that can activate this pathway. The first is low volume, and this can be associated with dehydration, low sodium, or sodium deficiency, or hemorrhage. The other is increased potassium in the extracellular fluid. So examining low sodium and dehydration hypovolemia first, this will result in a low blood volume and a decreased blood pressure. This will be sensed by the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney, and this will cause the kidney to increase renin production. The liver at baseline is always producing angiotensinogen, and this will promote renin to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme, and angiotensin converting enzyme is released from capillaries. It is often stated that this occurs in the lungs, and the reason is because that the highest density of capillaries within the body is within the lungs. Angiotensin II itself has vasoconstriction effects and will result in an increase in blood pressure, thus reaching the endpoint of this pathway. It will also act on the zona glomerulosa of the cortex of your adrenal gland. This will cause your zona glomerulosa to make mineral corticoids, specifically aldosterone. Aldosterone will act on the kidneys to 
to increase sodium and therefore water and bicarbonate and chloride retention and will cause the kidneys to secrete potassium and hydrogen ions in the urine. This will increase blood volume and increase blood pressure. The second stimulatory mechanism as discussed is increased extracellular fluid potassium levels. This will act directly on the adrenal gland, zona glomerulosa, to result in the same net effect. So the overall effect of this pathway is to promote the retention of water and the increase of blood pressure. The zona fasciculata is the end organ of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis. And the zona fasciculata secretes glucocorticoids, specifically cortisol. And going to the top of the axis, which would be the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus will release CRH, which is corticotropin-releasing hormone. This will act on the anterior pituitary and promote its release of ACTH, or adrenocorticotropic hormone. This will act on the zona fasciculata and promote the release of glucocorticoids, specifically cortisol. Cortisol will have a negative feedback and will inhibit the higher structures within this axis. The effect of cortisol are several, and those are proteolysis of skeletal muscle, and proteolysis is the breakdown of proteins into smaller polypeptides and amino acids, which can be used for energy. Gluconeogenesis within the liver, gluconeogenesis is the generation of glucose from non-carbohydrate carbon substrates, such as pyruvate, lactate, glycerol, and glucogenic amino acids. Lipolysis of fat, and lipolysis is the breakdown of lipids and triglycerides into glycerol and free fatty acids, all of which can be used as substrate for energy. Other effects of glucocorticoids include stress state adaptation and a synergistic effect with catecholamines, such that there is increased sensitivity to vasoconstrictors and vascular reactivity, it also has anti-inflammatory effects and immunosuppressive effects. So the zona glomerulosa is promoting fluid retention and increased blood pressure. The zona fasciculata is increasing mobilization of substrate from various bodily tissues for acute energy consumption, as well as synergistic vasoreactive effects with catecholamines. The medulla secretes catecholamines, and it does so through the tyrosine cascade. And tyrosine is converted by tyrosine hydroxylase to DOPA, or dihydroxyphenylalanine. DOPA is then converted to dopamine, which we all recognize. Dopamine is then converted to norepinephrine. And through phenylphenolamine and methyltransferase, norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine. So as you can see, all of the catecholamines are related through a metabolic pathway that is carried out within the medulla. And if you go back to the beginning of the adrenal portion of this discussion, when we discuss the embryologic origin of the medulla, it comes from the neural crest cells. So if an infant were to have a cancerous lesion to arise within the medulla, because their medulla neural crest cells are not fully differentiated at that point, they would have a neuroblastoma, and the neuroblastoma would secrete dopamine. If an adult were to have a cancer in the same region within their medulla, their cells are fully differentiated. They are no longer neural crest cells, they are now chromatin cells. And a cancer in the same lesion would be a pheochromocytoma. And because their cellular machinery is fully developed such that they can synthesize the full catecholamine pathway, they will secrete epinephrine. The effects of catecholamines are, again, stress state adaptation. Alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors within adipose tissue will bring about increased lipolysis and therefore increased free fatty acids within the blood, which can be used as substrate for vital organs. Alpha and beta-1 receptors within the liver will cause increased glycogen lysis, which is glycogen breakdown into glucose, again, increasing blood glucose such that it can be used for vital organs as substrate and energy. Beta receptors within the skeletal muscle will bring about increased twitch and therefore increased lactate within the blood, again, an emergency source of energy. Arteries within the muscle and the heart by way of alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors 
will have a vasodilation and allow for increased blood flow to these vital organs so, so they can perform better. Arteries within the skin, kidneys, and mesentery will vasoconstrict such that blood will not unnecessarily go to these non-vital structures. Alpha receptors within the veins will cause venous constriction and therefore increase venous return to the heart and thereby increase cardiac output. Beta-1 receptors within the heart will increase the rate and force of contraction, again, increasing the cardiac output such that greater emergency performance can be obtained. And beta-2 receptors within the bronchi of the lungs will bring about bronchodilation such that there can be greater ventilation and removal of carbon dioxide and upload of oxygen. So if you look at all of the functions of the adrenal gland, both the cortex and the medulla, it's about survival. If you were to have a lion chasing you, and let's say you were to be injured, such that you were scratched and significantly bleeding, you would want your zona glomerulosa to hold on to sodium and therefore hold on to water and allow you to have a greater volume of blood, such that you can have a greater cardiac output. You would want mobilization of substrates from your muscles, your liver, and your fat, such that you have energy to fight or flight and this would be carried out by your glucocorticoids and your zona fasciculata. And your catecholamines also would, in, in a synergistic way, A, mobilize energy from various body tissue beds, including fat, liver, and skeletal muscle, but it will also enhance the performance of your cardiac system. It will shunt blood away from non-vital structures. If you're bleeding, you want to shunt blood away from your skin so you do not continue to bleed. And you want to shunt blood away from your kidneys so that you cease making urine or make as little urine as possible so you can hold on to as much fluid as you can. You also want to shunt blood away from your enteric tract. The amount of blood required for digestion is significant and requires a significant amount of energy and it is easier to mobilize energy from other structures, specifically glycogen stores within your liver, as well as fat tissues and skeletal muscle. In an emergency situation, it is a more efficient and fast way of obtaining energy. And the direct effect of catecholamines will be to increase heart and lung performance. And so blood is shunted to the organs that need it most, the heart, the lungs, the brain, and the skeletal muscle, and their performance is enhanced. And the interesting thing is that the cortex and the medulla, which are tissues from separate embryologic origins, have a synergistic effect together, such that the glucocorticoids from the zona fasciculata optimize the ability of the catecholamines from the medulla to work together. And in addition to the four common subtypes of distributive shock, there are two diagnoses which aren't truly distributive shock, however, their hemodynamic profiles mimic that of distributive shock. And the two diagnoses uh, would be an aortocaval fistula and end stage liver disease. And the aortocaval fistula would be an extremely large central shunt. So when we had the example of the heart, with the lungs on the top and the cell on the bottom and the artery and venous and the shunt over here, very close to the peripheral tissues, an aortocaval fistula would be more like over here. And so as a result, would have a similar hemodynamic profile, although slightly different in pathology and anatomy. And end-stage liver disease, again, would have to do with um, the amount of leaking capillaries and oncotic versus hydrostatic pressure um, in, would point a similar uh, picture almost to septic shock and the inability to hold on to fluid. The next type of shock that we will be talking about is obstructive shock. And obstructive shock can be thought of as the sh surgeon's shock. It requires a mechanical fix to correct it. Uh, however, the initial treatment is still the same. It's still fluid and oxygen. Um, there are various subtypes. You can have uh, cardiac tamponade. You can have a tension pneumo. And you can have uh, massive pulmonary embolism. 
and the mass of PE physiologically from the parameters point of view looks very similar to these two. So even though it's not quite the same mechanism of compression, um, it is grouped together in obstructive shock. And the primary problem in obstructive shock is actually two problems. You have a low preload and a low myocardial contractility. Low preload, low myocardial contractility. So this means that your compensation is going to be limited. You're going to try and compensate by increasing your afterload and increasing your heart rate. So you will see your systemic vascular resistance go up and you'll see your heart rate go up. The treatment, again, first line, do what the body can't do, optimize your preload and optimize your oxygenation. So it's going to be fluid and oxygen. Um, but from there on, if it's a cardiac tamponade, if it's chronic, you may be doing a pericardiosynthesis or a pericardial window, might need a subxycoid window, it depends on the situation, how aggressively you're going to go after that tamponade and how quickly you're going to go after it. If they're really manifesting symptoms of shock, you should be moving faster than slower and doing something more significant than, uh, than just perhaps a, a quick needle drainage. Tension pneumothorax immediately can be relieved with needle decompression in the second inter intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, but we need to be followed up with a chest tube. Um, and massive PE would require heparinization and supportive care, but again, the treatment is going to be to increase your preload. And now notice, in this particular scenario, I have not talked about uh, CVP, and there's a reason. We need to have a bit of a discussion on CVP. So CVP is an indirect measurement of volume, all right? It's central venous pressure. So we would like to think that central venous pressure equals central venous volume, and sometimes it kind of does, but for the most part, it's not exactly. It is indirect, all right? And as such, it can be influenced by outside sources. So if you have your heart and a catheter going into your atrium. Our hope is that the fluid, which is pushing outwards against the wall of the heart, is generating a pressure, and that is what we're measuring. Such that in that particular scenario, the greater the preload or the greater the volume would equal a greater CVP, okay? In obstructive shock, however, you have extrinsic pressure. You have pressure pushing on the outside of your heart such that your preload is going to be low because the heart is not going to be allowed to fill. However, you are still going to have a high CVP. And in that case, a high CVP can mean two things. It could mean hypervolemia, or in this particular case, it could mean hypovolemia, okay? So it's important to understand that. And even in the case of when our CVP means what we want it to mean, meaning that our pressure does represent our volume, you do need to keep in mind that our compliance is equal to our volume divided by our pressure. So if I have a specific volume and my compliance is very down, I have a very stiff, diseased, hypertrophied heart, I'm going to have a very high pressure, a high CVP associated with it. Whereas if I have a very, let's say, normal sort of compliant young heart, okay, well, I'm going to have a much lower pressure associated with the same volume. So different pressures can represent different volumes based upon compliance. So the CVP is determined by whether the source of pressure is intrinsic or extrinsic, it is determined by the compliance of the surrounding cardiac tissue and whether it is dilated and hypertrophied in the, in the amount of diastolic dysfunction and whether or not there is distal valvular disease. And so for all of these reasons, CVP is an indirect measurement of volume and can be thought of sort of as a dirty number, um, not always representing what you want it to. So if you were to look at a textbook and look at the traditional chart of all the types of shock and all the hemodynamic parameters and which ones go up and which ones go down and the expectation of you to arbitrarily memorize them, you would see that the CVP for obstructive shock is up. 
and you would miss the understanding that that high CVP represents low volume, a low preload. And really, that's the type of understanding that I'm hoping the lecture will convey to you in this particular case. Obstructive shock is low preload and low contractility. You cannot fill and you can't contract because you can't expand to contract prior to contraction. So we've talked about low preload or hypovolemic shock. We've talked about low afterload or uh, distributive shock. And we've talked about obstructive shock being a combination of low preload and my low myocardial contractility. And now what we want to talk about is cardiogenic shock. And in this case, it's low myocardial contractility and sometimes low heart rate. And we'll discuss that. And there are different categories. You can have either A or dysrhythmic. And in this case, this is basically what your ACLS algorithms are about. This is when you go into shock because you've gone into um, a hemodynamically unstable rhythm, pulseless VT or VFib or asystole. And you know, to learn how to do, deal with that type of shock, you just need to take an ACLS course. And it's beyond uh, the desired direction of this lecture. You can have cardiogenic shock, which is mechanical in origin and is usually um, would be associated with cardiac defects, ASDs, VSDs, um, blown papillary muscles, or acute valvular disorders, right? And again, this is also not necessarily what people tend to think about when they think about cardiogenic shock. The main type of cardiogenic shock that we deal with is myopathic. And really, this is what most people think about when they think of cardiogenic shock, the muscle, uh, heart muscle itself, uh, not contracting uh, with adequate force or with an adequate rate. And so again, what is the primary disorder in this type of shock? Well, it is a low myocardial contraction, okay? And in the case, if you knock out your right coronary artery and the supply to your SA node and the blood to your conduction system, you can plus or minus also have bradycardia and a low heart rate and therefore lose one of your compensation mechanisms. So, Compensation mechanisms, again, you can't make new water, you can't extract more oxygen, hemoglobin takes too long. Your options are to increase your SVR, your systemic vascular resistance, to clamp down, and as long as you didn't knock out your conduction system, to increase your heart rate. And that's how you're going to compensate. What is your treatment going to be? Well, initially it's the same as always, do what the body can't do, increase your preload, increase your oxygen, so you're gonna do fluid, and FiO2, the two Fs. And from there, you're going to want to optimize um, your primary deficit or attack your primary deficit. And you do this with inotropes or chronotropes. Give them dobutamine, give them epinephrine, give them milrinone, or paste them and or whatever combination you need thereof to attack their primary problem. And when you're thinking about cardiogenic shock and myopathic cardiogenic shock uh, in specific, remember that it is going to be broken up into right-sided and left-sided. And certainly you can have both. And the best way to think about this is if you have your myocardial contraction, which is in deficit at that particular point, everything prior to it is going to get backed up. So if you imagine a 10-lane highway with 10 toll booths, and the highway being your venous system leading to your heart and the toll booths being the function of the heart. If you just shut eight of them down and now you only have two toll booths, you're gonna have a huge traffic jam, this buildup of pressure and angry drivers before the heart. So you're gonna have an elevated CVP. You're going to get congestion as a result of that decrease in efficiency and decrease in function, okay? Your compensation mechanism, like we talked about, is going to be increase the heart rate if it can, okay? Which means get through the people through faster, but you still only have two open toll booths, so that's only gonna work so much. Or to increase their afterload, in which case you're going to clamp down, and here it's going to be your pulmonary vascular resistance, right? Now this same thing is analogous and happens on the left side as well. In the case, what is before the heart on the left side, we know we have a decreased myocardial 
cardio contractility on the left side. What is before it, you're going to get a congestion of your PAOP, your pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, the pressure measurement on the left side of your heart. And afterwards, you're going to clamp down as a response to it by increasing your systemic vascular resistance. And that's basically how this schematic relates to the concept of what is in deficit and what is in compensation and how that leads to the delivery of oxygen. So we come full circle at this point and back to the beginning of the lecture and what matters most in the delivery of oxygen and the uptake of oxygen and the balance between the two of them with our VO2 on the bottom and our delivery up top and arterial and venous on each side and our, our uh, ABG and our arterial saturation and our VBG and our mixed venous on this side uh, really representing what we have been able to deliver and how much we have been able to uptake what we have delivered. So when we have our patients postoperatively and they're in the ICU, there can be various clues to whether or not they're perfusing themselves well. Not all of these parameters we can measure and we can measure well. Certainly we can measure with a blood gas these parameters. With a you know, hemoglobin hematocrit, we can me measure our hemoglobin. We can obviously see our heart rate. With an SVR, we can see our afterload. With our CVP, we have an estimate of our preload. And if we get an echo, we can maybe see our uh, degree of myocardial contractility. And through different mathematical formulas, we get our products of our stroke volume and our cardiac output, and ultimately what the delivery of oxygen is going to be. So for the most part, we tend to follow a very downstream product. Uh, we want to get as close to the DO2 as possible. We'll follow our cardiac output, usually, and our cardiac output and index, and we want to make sure it's within the normal uh, range. And we use this often as a surrogate of how good of a job we are doing of delivering our oxygen to our tissues. And when we do that, we're looking on the arterial side of this schematic. We also will check a gas, which will give us our PO2 and SpO2, and our hemoglobin. And again, we can measure these things, but we tend to look at the product. This way we get a global picture of how all of these things are interacting and what they are yielding as an end result. But again, our DO2 and our VO2 need to be in balance. So while we want to make sure that what contributes to our delivery of oxygen is good, the way that we really assess what our uptake has been and how much of that DO2 is actually getting there and how much we're utilizing is by looking at our mixed venous or our, our SVO2. And again, we wanna make sure that is within the acceptable range, not too high and not too low. And our options for optimizing this are to increase our preload, uh, give them volume, increase our afterload, give them a vasopressor if they need it, if they're dilated, increase their contractility or their heart rate, possibly transfuse them, or increase their oxygenation. So if you have a patient who has, let's say, a low bicarb, which can be evidence of poor end organ perfusion, if they have an elevated lactate, such that they are converting from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism and generating lactate as a byproduct, which is going to be an organic acid, and that organic acid will be buffered by their bicarb, you know, it will be evidence of the fact that our delivery is inadequate, and we will often see a very low SVO2 as a result. If you are in shock and you are not perfusing your tissue beds, you will make a shift from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. And the three portions, if you remember from physiology, of aerobic metabolism are glycolysis, your citric acid cycle or your Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, or your electron transport chain. And glycolysis is responsible for the production of two ATP and two pyruvate as a net in the presence of oxygen. This is fed into your citric acid cycle, which then feeds into electron transport chain. And the net result is the production of about 36 ATP per glucose molecule in the presence of oxygen. In the absence of oxygen, there is a shift to anaerobic metabolism, 
And instead of yielding two ATP and two pyruvate, which then can feed into the citric acid cycle, anaerobic glycolysis produces two ATP and two lactate, which cannot feed into the citric acid cycle. So aerobic metabolism essentially is stopped at that point, and anaerobic takes over. So you produce far less ATP, you do so much faster, but the net result is a significant lactic acidosis. So when we have our patients in uh, post-operative in the ICU, if your cardiac output is good, then hey, great, thumbs up. If your cardiac output is in deficit though, you need to investigate whether or not you're having tissue evidence of low cardiac output going in that direction. And you would investigate by assessing your acid base status, making sure what type of metabolism you're in, aerobic versus anaerobic, and how much oxygen is successfully being extracted. And from those pieces of information, we can decide how to further optimize our delivery of oxygen in face of what our VO2 is as well. And so we've talked about shock and hopefully united all of the different types of shock such that they can be understood as one common entity and one common framework and just different expressions of that framework. And we've done various side lectures which will hopefully give insight to various different topics and enrich your understanding of shock as a whole. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and found it interesting, and I hope we achieved our goal of giving you a unified understanding of the topic such that you view it as a single entity with multiple expressions. And I hope that you can take the lecture and put it into clinical practice right away, and given the frequency with which we treat shock, I expect you will be able to, and I hope with much success. So as always, thank you for your time and your interest.